GM's in the hot seat. One shock after another from Michigan's congressional delegation. Deals aren't getting any better for Detroit's bankruptcy and the president's in town. Can there be any more news this week in Michigan? It's the analysis you don't want to miss. My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. It has been a week of change here in Michigan. The announcement of yet another retirement among senior members of Michigan's congressional delegation. Who fills the leadership void and what this means for Michigan? Also, General Motors CEO Mary Barra takes the heat from Congress on the auto company's ignition problems. Plus, change in Detroit's bankruptcy plan of adjustment. The longer time goes by, the deals aren't getting any better. And President Obama brings his minimum wage message to Michigan. It is all coming up for you tonight, but we do start tonight with more political shockers. This week, Congressman Dave Camp from the 4th District announced he was retiring after 23 years in Washington. And that was just days after Republicans got the sudden and bad news that Congressman Mike Rogers was retiring. Add that to Democrat Congressman John Dingell and Senator Carl Levin, who we already knew were leaving, you have some serious turnover in Michigan's congressional delegation. How does this impact the kind of clout that Michigan has in Washington? And for Republicans, this is a serious scramble to find the next generation of leadership. Let's get to it tonight with our My Week contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. It's good to hear, hear, be here. Yeah, I, you had a nice uh, time off last week. We're glad you are back. So let's get started. Uh, never mind all that. What about those cats? <laughs> you know, you, I know you always wanted to start with cats. basketball in the NCAA. <laughs> here in Michigan, we're not too thrilled with uh, the Kentucky Wildcats. <laughs> it was a good game. Great game. Uh, Payback for 20 years ago when we beat them. In the well, final. 20 years ago, we're going to have to do a little bit better <laughs> in recent wrong. times now. <laughs> right. All right, well, we'll be watching this weekend. All right, let's get in on to the serious stuff, though. If you're the Republicans, you have to be saying, whoa, what just happened in the last week for the Michigan congressional delegation? And how are we going to replace that kind of senior leadership? Well, Republicans and Democrats, if you look at, at um, uh, the landscape this year, you've got four open congressional seats uh, and an open Senate seat. You've got to count the Gary Peters seat because he's leaving that open. That's an open race. Right. This is the most interesting and intense <clears throat> uh, congressional election I can remember. You've got five open congressional seats and five or six others that are going to be competitive. And that just goes against sort of the, the um, grain in recent years where redistricting has made these seats fairly safe. You've got a wide open congressional contest this time. You know, when you think about when they've given their notice that they're going to retire, should have they have thought about this a little beforehand? Mike Rogers says he's going to go have a radio career. Yeah. Now, Dave Camp just said he is he is done. He hasn't yeah. said what he's going to do after this. But should they have given a little bit more leeway and, and heads up? I mean, I think if you're both parties, you absolutely want them to give you more more time to, to find somebody to replace uh, them and to raise the money. You know, these seats are very expensive uh, to run for now. It used to be a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, you would see to, to spend on a on a congressional seat. Now we're up in the millions. Yeah. Uh, it, it's it's really hard to get that cash together. Um, I, I, I'm a little suspicious that Mike Rogers probably knew that this was in the works, um, you know, earlier. Uh, and that's one of the reasons he didn't run for the Senate seat that, that's open. He would have been, I think, right, he was really, up for Carl really good I don't think that's why that. he didn't run for the Senate seat. No. But Steve, he certainly knew he was negotiating this deal. I'm, and, and it's possible that he didn't know it was going to come yeah, through. Yeah, right. Um, but I think Camp is the is the bigger, is, is the less excusable one because he cited it as his reason. He's term He's limited out as chairman. Well, he knew months ago he was going to yeah. be term limited out as chairman. They gave these folks three weeks to go out there and put together a team to raise signatures 
and make that decision, make really a life-changing decision yeah. in a matter of hours or days, because you can't take, when you only have three weeks, you can't take two weeks to make up your mind. No. It's, it, they made it very I mean, tough other, for, a, a, for people to consider and weigh the decision and then go out there and act on it. And I think it hurts it hurts Michigan because you're not necessarily going to get the best candidates in the field. No, you're going to get people who can who can finance. Who've been right? there before. And who've been there before. The other thing I think is really interesting here is uh, the sort of uh, I've had enough attitude uh, that, that, that you're hearing from these people who are leaving. Mike Rogers, uh, uh, because he chairs the House Intelligence Committee, I mean, this is one of the top five or ten, in the top five or ten most powerful positions in Washington. I mean, it, he really is uh, in senior leadership. And he's saying, look, I, can, I feel like I can move the ball more, I can get more done uh, if I go be a radio host. And that's, well, and that's, I think that that's a sad state of affairs. It, it says quite everything about what's going on in Congress. Uh, and, I, that, and I would also <clears> say <throat> that Dave Camp has also been considered that kind of guy who has worked sure. on both sides of the aisles. He even oh, tried to have Congress. some kind of tax reform in sure. the last couple of months and really went at it. Yeah. And then for him all of a sudden to be like, you know what, yeah. I am not going to run again. I think it is too hard. You heard John Dingell say when he retired, you know, this mm -hmm. is not the same place I joined uh, in terms of getting stuff done and working together. I think, you know, there is a real problem with the way Congress works. Uh, and, and there's a real frustration among adults who are there, who, who are there to get something done, that you've got a lot of other people who are there to, 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 to play silly politics well, all the time. There's also the, the personal element. Both of these guys served as chairman, as Steve yes. mentioned, a very powerful committee. <clears throat> Camp was term limited. Um, Rogers as chairman, is, as chairman uh, as of the chairman, Ways and Means. But Rogers is not necessarily terminal because that doesn't apply to his position. Right. But he couldn't get a commitment that he'd be reappointed. And once you've been chairman and had your fanny kissed <laughs> and people <laughs> scraping and bowing to you yeah. and it's Mr. Chairman this and Mr. Chair, it's hard to go back and sit in, in the, the bleachers. For, yeah, you know, right. and, and Camp specifically cited that, that yeah. you know, he couldn't get his agenda through his chairman. He probably wasn't going to move the needle much when he's not when chairman. he's not chairman what does this mean now for Michigan in terms of the clout that Michigan has in Washington right now and maybe will not have we won't get come more, next fall we won't get two more chairs out of it right in the in the in the near term and, uh, the, Senate, it, and, and, and the Senate and the Senate and that's right with, with Levin leaving too well armed that, services I, I tend to take you know the sort of long view of this stuff too though uh, think of how senior the delegation is and was. I mean, that's a problem too, right? Uh, that 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 uh, you're not giving uh, younger people the opportunity to go serve. You're not building up the seniority that they that they need to be uh, chairs of committees and and things like that. So, it, you know, you are losing that that clout, but you're also opening up uh, a chance to to replenish the, the bench. And for its size, <clears throat> Michigan had the most clout of any delegation in Washington. Yes. And if you look not just at the retirements, but the competitive races, Ben Fioli in Oakley County has a competitive race. Uh, Benishek, real competitive race yeah. up north. Justin Amash, uh, Wahlberg, all you have very Justin, competitive races. I think Ryan that guy's raising a lot of money. Brian Ellis out there. Yeah. Uh, John Conyers now has yes. a, a legitimate challenger. You could end up with a delegation that's majority freshman when this thing's all over. So where is the next generation of leadership? Where are we going to see these candidates start to come from? And they've got to come out in the next in the next three weeks. Well, that's the one benefit of term limits. So you've got a lot of term limits, limited lawmakers looking for things to do, still interested in politics. And I think the bulk of these, uh, these slots will be filled by folks who are term limited out of the legislature. And I think people will also be looking at now party switch. Are we going to see these Republican seats in the fourth and the eighth possibility going to the Democrats? I think that's a tough, the fourth, I, I don't think you have much chance at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these, these districts were drawn uh, in 2010 in very safe ways, both uh, on the Democratic side, the, the seats that are Democratic now are very safe Democratic. The ones on the Republican side are very safe Republican. I think if you get the right Democrat in the eighth, uh, you know, uh, a Barb Byram, uh, who's the clerk in Lansing, 
Um, maybe you make that a more competitive seat, but the numbers are just so heavily weighted against uh, against that kind of party switch. I think it would take something. Yeah, and that's why you don't see a whole lot of Democrats jumping up and saying, I'm going to run for this seat. Like, yeah. you don't see any Republicans jump up and say, I'm going to run for Peter's seat. Those, they're safely drawn. Where you're likely to see the switch is in that first district up north where Benishek uh, two elections ago yeah. won a Democratic seat. Right. That district is still heavily Democratic sure. and they've got a good candidate. They're gonna, the, the, the National Party is spending a lot of money to get a Democratic elected <laughs> up there. It's just a matter of time before Beneshek loses that seat. Yeah, right. that's, I mean, uh, you're right. That's a Democratic seat that mm -hmm. they've held for a couple terms, but they yeah. won't they won't keep it forever. All right, moving on tonight. General Motors is navigating a PR minefield after CEO Mary Barra testified in front of Congress this week. What did GM know? When did they know it regarding faulty ignition switches? And what will they do for the victims? But really, does the new GM look an awful like, like the old one in the court of public opinion? So everyone has been watching this week and critiquing Mary Barra's performance in front of Congress and really Congress's performance as well when they when they questioned her. Nolan, how has GM come out of this? this this week? Well, it's, that's still to be determined. She had a rough couple of days. I mean, Congress, uh, uh, the, these Congress women particularly were extremely tough on her. They weren't buying this. You know, that was the old GM. I'm the new GM. I don't really know what's happening. It's harder for her to make the case that she's new GM when she grew up in General Motors. And I think she, the, when she, they, she went before Congress, the Congress uh, members expected her to know more and say more. Of course, you know, she's still in the middle of an investigation. She She's limited in, in how much she, she can say. She may be even limited in how much she she does know. But this has not been, you know, this is, this is perhaps the biggest automotive story other than the bankruptcy we've seen in decade years. And it has a, a the real potential to derail the General Motors comeback. When we have Congress questioning a CEO like this, what do we get out of both sides of this? I mean, Congress has an op Congress is an opportunity to kind of you show say, off a little bit. Congress, this is what you wait for, yeah. right? Uh, the, you, you get one of the most powerful people in the private sector, the, you know, you get to summon them before you and uh, you can you can have the floor as long as you want. Make a big show for the voters back home, but it's always Absolutely. amusing to see these people going after a business person. Why didn't you know this? How did you let this happen? You're thinking, wait a minute, don't you all it's run Congress. the federal government? It's Congress, I mean, right. <laughs> all right, so we can, la we can laugh about that, but I mean, does there come a time and say, what did we really get out of this? And, and is this an exercise in what? Well, I mean, I think this is this is the theater part of it. It always it always is. Congress really can't do very much uh, uh, to GM because of this. Th this will be resolved in the courts, uh, both civil and I. Th I think there could be some criminal be. activity that, that that comes out of this. You read those memos uh, where they're looking at this problem, identifying it, and then may saying things like, "There is no business case to to deal with it." I mean. This is like stuff out of the 70s and 80s with, with uh, you know, deregulated auto companies doing crazy stuff. Uh, I was rem reminded of Ford with the, with the Pinto uh, problems that they had. A very similar kind of case where uh, they knew that, that things were wrong and didn't fix it. And there was a lot of liability that that came out of that. Um, Perhaps even worse, because this was a $5 part. Right, that's right. Yeah. I mean, you're not talking about a, a, a major... Uh, expense on their on their part, and they still said, you know, better to better to let it play out than to than to recall all these all these vehicles. So, how does this figure for GM? And obviously, we still have to, the fall ha still has to happen for months to come. But what could this possibly do to a company that has come out of bankruptcy and has touted been touted as all right, bigger and better and stronger and making cars that are good, safe, and reliable? What does this do now for them for their customer base? It's essential that General Motors refine that me that message and perfect that message of old GM versus new GM. So far, the sales are holding up. GM sales are holding up and they have to reassure their customers that was the old company and they did business a different way than the new company does business. But they got to also make sure that's true and they have to demonstrate it's true. How is this new GM different than the old GM? So if this um, incident happened today 
it would be handled differently. All right, we'll watch and wait. Turning now to Detroit's bankruptcy, Kevin Orr filed an updated plan of adjustment on Monday with some bigger cuts, signaling a new phase of negotiation. So here are the cuts for you. Police and fire retirees would see a 14% cut instead of the original 10%. The city would now pay general obligation bondholders 15 cents on the dollar from 20 cents. And a big change speaks directly to pension management moving forward. Eliminate the current board of trustees for the general pension fund as well as for police and fire. And there are new details about the city's reinvestment, including $78 million to hire more civilians in the police department, $25 million for a Department of Transportation Security Force, and over $90 million for software and service to improve the city's IT system. You know, as the deals get worked out or they don't get worked out, we could see more changes in the next coming weeks. So Kevin Orr is signaling, well, you didn't like that deal. Guess what? You're probably really not going to like this deal. And that's the stage where the, the negotiations have entered that stage where instead of adding things to the table to sweeten a deal, they're taking things off the table to pressure folks into a, a settlement. You move from carrot to stick. And I think this is not a bluff. The deal is going to continue to get worse uh, the longer they dawdle and wait. There's no more money out there to make things better. And at some point, these creditors have to come to the realization that this is it. So we've been watching, and this slowly progressed, even, or actually quickly progressed. We are now in a new stage of negotiation, would you say? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, this is actually the stage of the negotiation we've been in from, from, from the jump. I mean, uh, in an ordinary bankruptcy, the first plan of adjustment would have been uh, put out there with a time right? Uh, this is what you get if you agree within the next 14 days, right? And, and the deal gets worse from there. Kevin Orr didn't do that. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that in municipal bankruptcies you, you tend to do things as hard as hardcore as that, but he certainly, it, the way he's used to dealing with, uh, with things like this, that's how you do it. And so uh, he's had this deal on the table for, what, a, a couple months now? Um, and left it the way it is, you know, I think he's saying, I, I don't have time to wait. The city doesn't have time to wait. As Nolan pointed out, there's not going to be any more money than there is now. It's less. So you better take what's what's here or you're going to end up with nothing. And, you know, there, there are some, some real time deadlines here. The governor would like to get his budget done by the end of May. <clears throat> uh, they've got to include this, the state's portion of this eight hundred and sixty. Yeah. $16 million bailout in the state budget. The foundations are getting a little nervous about, uh, you know, they thought this would settle it. When they came up with three hundred and six or $460 million, million dollars, they thought this was going to settle things. And, and, and as it turns out, you know, they, it's getting thrown I mean, back you in still their have, You still have this tension between the pensioners who, you know, are the most vulnerable class uh, of, of creditor. It feels like all the focus is on them right now and oh, whether they're going you know, to move. I, it's really hard to make the case that, that, you know, old people who cannot necessarily go back to work ought to have to take a hit. But at the same time, there's just not enough money to pay off all of the all, all of what the city owes, and so the question becomes: How do how does the pension, the current pension board, get its members to see that this is maybe the right deal uh, or the best deal you can get um, out of the city? And I don't I don't think that's an easy. It's not an easy sell. I, I'm not even quite sure the pension board thinks it's the best deal they're going to get, so why would they well, even want to convince their people? They're counting on this court of appeals case to uphold the Michigan constitutional protection of pensions. I think that's a long shot, but, you know, you're right. The pensioners are the most critical element here because the unsecured creditors are going to take what they get. And they're, I mean, they get don't, they're not holding any mortgage. They've got no promise. If, if it comes down to zero, there's not much they can, they can do. I mean, they can squawk and, 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 and moan, but... They're unsecured creditors. The secured creditors should find should have found out today whether or not you know that deal or negotiated is going to go, go through. That leaves the pensioners, and and you've got to come to some agreement with the pensioners. Nobody wants to cram down uh, more severe cuts on the pensioners, but at some point it's going to come to that. The discussions of the negotiations is always very interesting, and I know that we've talked about it a lot through this entire process. I always think it's important, though, when we talk about <coughs> that that plan of adjustment, is to put up those numbers as well of the money that, the, that they look to reinvest back into the city and where that's going to go, because that, to me, is the key process of why we're all doing this, of, of, of the end of the finish line of what we all want to see happen to the city, that you need money to improve basically how this city runs when you're talking of millions 
millions of dollars going into a new IT service or just millions of dollars in hiring civilians in the police department so you can get officers out of those desk jobs and back on the um, back on the streets. Yeah. Well, I mean that's the that was the 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 flip side of the the renegotiation of the swaps, right? Originally that that we'd get a loan to settle the swaps and then get another loan uh, to to plow into services. The, the judge split that up because he was uncomfortable with the the swaps part of that deal and they had to go back and renegotiate that a few times and now we finally have him signing off on the 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 services side of that and that's going to make a big difference one of the things i think people have forgotten is that even when we get out of bankruptcy uh later this year things are going to be really tight in detroit i mean this gets a lot of the debt off our back uh it restructures some other things but it doesn't fix the revenue problem that we have, and the revenue projections over the next 10 years are not great. They don't grow uh, until the, the latter part of this decade. Um, it's going to be tough to deliver the services we need to deliver to attract people back. It's not just that we have to maintain what we're doing now, which no. is really bad. We've got to make it better, and there's not necessarily a lot of money to do that. Detroit has become a growing city. This bankruptcy deal, if, if it goes through, as proposed, will free up about $150 million a year for the new mayor. That's a lot That's of a money. Lot. But it doesn't it's, it's not necessarily enough to improve all the services that need improving, to create a city that people want to come to. <clears throat> and, and as Steve said, that's the overall goal here. All right, we'll be watching the process. Well, President Obama was in Michigan this week. He was taking his message about the minimum wage and raising it here to Michigan. And uh, he stopped by and he had a sandwich at Zingerman's, of course, because <laughs> that's what you have to do when you're, uh, when you're in Ann Arbor. And Where Nolan, you that loved that so part of the times. story. Uh, well, I thought it was so rich. You know, you're in here saying, well, look, Zingerman's, they pay their workers more than minimum wage. Why can't everybody pay their workers more than minimum wage? $16 for a sandwich. <laughs> his bill for his one lunch was 23 bucks. You go out to Warren or Taylor and try to sell that to these small <laughs> yeah. business That's people. That's a good sandwich, hey, though, Nolan. Nolan, that bucks. is a good of sandwich from is. Zingerman's. Of course it is, <laughs> but not everybody can afford that. Yeah. And, I mean, you go out in other places and tell a businessman, Hey, just charge 16 bucks for your sandwiches. You'll be okay. Well, I think the other thing, though, though <laughs> Zingerman's is world-renowned for the business structure that it has, and, uh, and and part of that is paying competitive wages. Now, $16 sounds like a lot for a sandwich, and it would be in Warren. It's not in Ann Arbor. Uh, Zingerman's is not is not priced point, out of that though. market. And so uh, the, I think the point he's making is it's possible to pay people a living wage. De That's not Depending on your product and your location. Of course. I mean, you, you can't, but you take a guy um, in, in, on, in Detroit running a little deli selling, you know, meat and cheese sandwiches, you can charge <laughs> 16 bucks for those? You can't charge no. $16 you know, for that. I mean, That's how much... How much, you know, where, what's the market tolerate on that? Well, but the market has always tolerated increases in the minimum. But market. he's, he, and it's always cost workers every time we've done it. And then it can catches up when the can economy Can this economy at this point afford to lose I, I think that's workers. a great question. I don't know that we, I don't know that, uh, that I think that's the best way to do it. I think there are other ways to get money into people's pockets. And so how, how happy were the proponents for the Michigan, uh, or the minimum wage raise here in Michigan oh, that, that the president was coming into town and talking about this? I think they had to be very this. happy. I mean, this, this is a, uh, an issue that I was skeptical about three, four months ago, whether it would play. The polls now say you've got a majority of people saying that they, they want to see it happen. And so getting the president in to, to rally behind that is not a, is not a bad idea. It also helps him in Washington, where he's trying to raise it at the federal level. You can't it, smile and shake your head like that, Nolan. The, the reaction person, is priceless. The happiest person was Terry Lynn Land, because there was Gary Peters trotting along behind the president saying, I'm with him, I support his agenda. And I'll he's eat the having, same sandwich. Yeah, that he he's having corned having, beef, right? I'm having corned beef. Man, there's a hundred sound bites out of that for her campaign. All right, and we'll, and we'll watch that. One thing I wanted to get to before the, before the end of the show in just the two minutes that we have left is a story that's um, developing that came out today actually on Thursday talking about a possible corruption probe into Detroit City Council. Um, I was a little taken aback by that um, and surprised. You're laughing. Know, you Don't been? laugh about where that. Where have you been for the last 10 years? But, but again, the, the thought that we have been talking about the corruption era in the city of Detroit done, the fact that there have been so many prosecutions, the fact that the attorney's office has been so aggressive in going after it that there would be some whiff of something or is I'm just naive. Well, I, you know, I think there are, you still have 
patterns of practice in the way that we do things in Detroit that that are not the way that they that they should be. And was this uh, across the line? I don't I don't think I know. I don't think anybody knows. Lots of stuff goes to the grand jury uh, all the time and doesn't result in anything. And so I think you got to be real careful about jumping to to the conclusions. But uh, the, the scenario that's being laid out here is not implausible, right? Uh, uh, pay to play to try to get somebody votes to, to, to be in, in leadership. That's the, I, that's not just Detroit, Wayne, Wayne County, you know, uh, all, all over the place, this is how we have done business. But what's surprising about this and <clears throat> what's sort of, you know, uh, suspicious about this is, is, is the investigation is not focusing on Brenda Jones who won the council race, and we know there was horse trading there. Uh, Cushenberry said, yeah, we made deals. Yeah. Um, it's on Santiel Jenkins, a losing candidate who has been one of the highest integrity council people we've had around there. I think, you know, it, this very mal- well may reflect the zero tolerance uh, yeah. policy of Barb McQuaid. She's got a, a standing grand jury. She hears a rumor. She's going to bring in people to figure out and and see what happens. All right, gentlemen, (coughs) thank you so much. I appreciate it. And that is going to do it for My Week tonight. Thanks for joining us. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. And we are always at myweek.org. I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night. We'll see you next week. Take care. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michiganturnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.